I'm sure it's going to be a little hard to focus on serious stuff as we get closer and closer to Thanksgiving here, but um, let me introduce myself first um, for those of you who don't know me. My name is Don Vians. Um, I'm a forage breeder here in the Department of Plant Breeding and Genetics, and um, the reason why most of you don't run into me too much here in Bradfield Hall is that although I have an office upstairs in 523 Bradfield, I'm hardly ever in it. The uh, reason is because I'm also in administration here at Cornell. So if um, I welcome you to see me any time that you have questions or you're confused about the material that we're going to cover over the next couple of weeks. But uh, if you do need to see me, you can contact me by email, which I should put up on the board here too. I'm at drv3 at cornell.edu. Um, you can stop by my office. It's down at 151 Roberts Hall uh, because I spend most of my time down there uh, because I'm also Associate Dean and Director of Academic Programs in the college. So again, I welcome you to um, see me or contact me in any way that you wish uh, anytime you do have questions. But what we're going to be covering is population improvement. And in a little while, we're going to do a little experiment, just a simple experiment. But to do that experiment, what I need to have you do is to pass this container of M&Ms. There's multiple colors involved here. And I'm going to ask you to take this little scoop and just at random, as much as you can do at random, to scoop out 10 M&Ms, okay? And don't eat them yet or you're going to mess up the experiment. You'll be able to eat them uh, once the experiment's over. But take 10 M&Ms and put them on a table or on a paper or whatever right in front of you and just keep them there until we're ready to collect the data on it. So if you could do that and pass it around and uh, again, try to be as random as you can. And I've got the scoop there just you know, in case somebody has a cold or whatever. It's, you're not dipping your hands into the M&Ms and touching them for the next person after you there. Okay, with population improvement, what we're going to do with this is we're going to discuss this topic over the next five periods, in other words, the next two weeks. And what I'd like to do to give you a sneak preview of where we're going with it is, first of all, to discuss what population improvement is in the first place, okay? Because right now you probably have some vague concept, but but maybe not specifically understand what population improvement is. We're going to talk about what recurrent selection is because we're going to find out that most of the time to improve a population adequately enough to be able to extract material out of it to develop a variety that we need to go through recurrent selection. So today we'll define what that is and talk about why it's needed in the first place to improve a population sufficiently enough for you to do something with it in plant breeding. Thirdly, we're going to talk about, and this is where we're going to spend the bulk of our time, is we're going to discuss 10 different methods of improving a population, okay? So that's going to be covered in, in, in kind of a hurry, in a sense. I mean, there are going to be some class periods where we'll be covering four at a time. But I want to go slow enough, too, so that you can understand what these methods are all about. And then lastly, we'll take a few minutes and we'll discuss that, okay, now we've talked about 10 population improvement methods. How do you as plant breeders decide which one or ones that you might use in your own program? And you're going to find that it might be different methods that you use depending on the trait, the crop variety or the type of crop that you're working with, you know, a lot of variables in there to talk about. So this is essentially where we're heading with over the next class, uh, five class periods. With these first two, we'll be covering today and spending the bulk of the rest of our time talking about the third item up there. And again, anytime you have questions or comments, feel free to jump in um, because I don't want to spend 100% of my time just standing here lecturing at you, but uh, jump in with questions anytime that you wish. Okay, then let's talk about what population improvement is. Okay, with population improvement, let's look at the bird's eye view of it first. Any plant breeder working with any crop species is going to be having a number of, of germplasm sources in his or her collection there. You know, they might be seed in a little envelope or a big bag or whatever, but hopefully you're going to have a lot of germplasm sources to tap into to develop a variety. Now, those germplasm sources may have different attributes that are good. You know, may have one source might have some, one, some good traits and others other good traits, different origins. Um, some breeders will keep those apart. Others will take two or more and combine them together 
into at least one or maybe even more germplasm pools. So a germplasm pool is simply a broader, genetically broader based population where you're taking two or more germplasm sources, you combine them together, you intercross them so that you can get genetic recombination and in essence you're combining good traits into a bigger pool so that you can uh, get good recombinants to develop a variety from it. Okay, regardless of how you deal with it, whether it's separate germplasm sources or, or germplasm pools, you know, bigger populations, you will go into one or more of those populations, select material out of it, and develop some kind of a variety. Now right now I'm not talking about any specific kind of variety, but you'll develop some kind of a variety. By the way, with our discussions with population improvement, I'm going to be referring mostly to cross-pollinated species because that's where these methods are used most, but they can be used with self-pollinated species, particularly if you have um, some kind of a male sterility system that makes it easier to do the crosses with them. Um, but again, most of my examples will be with cross-pollinated species. And when we get to the breeding methods, um, you might get tired of it, but most of, most of the examples are with corn breeding because it was mostly corn breeders who developed these methods. But nowadays, uh, these methods are used mostly by forage breeders who work with perennial crops like I do, like with alfalfa and red clover and birch foot tree foil, some of the grasses and so forth. So as we go along, I'll show you how we've modified these methods from what corn breeders have developed to use them in forage breeding as well. For those of you who just came in, we're passing those around, not just the eight, but I want you to take ten of those at random and put them on in front of you. You know, take 10 because we're going to use those for an experiment in a little while and once we're done we'll, we'll let you eat them. In fact, once we're done with the experiment I'll let you pass it around and have more if you wish there. So be sure to take 10 so everybody has that and then we'll collect the data in a little bit. Okay, my question is then from this slide, once you develop some kind of a variety from a population or germplasm source, is it worth as a plant breeder to go back into the same population and try to extract material out of it again to see if you can develop an even better variety? Now, the answer could be yes or no. Um, I want to look at the yes answer. Under what circumstances would it be beneficial to go back in and see if you can extract material to develop an even better variety? Anybody have some ideas? Get the thought process going a little bit this morning early on. Yes? Yeah, if you can speak a little louder, sir, I can't even quite hear you. But Let's say if you, depends on what you selected for in the first variety, so if you want to select for a different trait. Okay. So you might have a different trait. You've already developed a variety, but um, now some, there's a need for a new trait. Maybe uh, an insect has become a problem or a new disease or something like that. So you might go back in and look for a different trait than you did before in developing a variety. Okay, so that's an excellent answer. Any other ideas that you have as well? There are a few of them. Yes? Okay, maybe a different environmental condition that you're developing a variety for, something like that. Okay, so you might go in and, and develop a variety again. Any others? How about if you, um, and both of those are really good answers. Another one I'm thinking of too is that maybe now you have um, a new way to evaluate that trait. For example, the first, maybe when you developed that first variety, you were breeding for resistance to some disease, and it's maybe, maybe your evaluation is just a visual evaluation of a leaf, and you're looking at the amount of the leaf that's covered by the disease, you know, the necrosis or chlorosis or whatever the symptoms are. And um, with your visual evaluation, it was fine, but, you know, you can get better. So now, after you develop that variety, some... Uh, a company has come up with some electronic equipment that instead of you doing just a visual estimate, now you can actually put that leaf somehow there with that piece of equipment, that machinery, and evaluate more precisely the percentage of that leaf that's covered by the necrosis. Okay, so you have a better technique to evaluate that trait. Or now you have a better breeding method to select for that trait, to evaluate the plants and you'll see the array of population improvement methods that we'll talk about over the next few class periods. So you tried one method, it worked kind of minimally, now you're going to go back in and use another breeding methods to see if you can 
do an even better job of, of identifying the superior genotypes and, and uh, breeding to make progress in selection. So all of those are reasons why you might go back into a population to reselect out of it to develop a new variety. It could be for any one of those reasons or a combination of them. But there's also a place there where doing all of those things might have a limitation on how much they work. In other words, you might want to actually take that population and improve it in some way so that you have a better chance of identifying superior genotypes in it. So that's what we're honing in on is population improvement. So with population improvement, um, you're going to grow out a bunch of plants somewhere wherever you can evaluate a trait, whether it's in a petri dish, where it's in a greenhouse, a growth chamber, or a field, or wherever. And um, excuse the fact that it looks like Christmas trees up here. It's all the clip art that I could find that looked like a plant. Um, but regardless of the species that you're interested in, you grow out a whole bunch of plants. And you want to be able to find plants that have the best combination of alleles and genes in them to um, develop a superior variety. Well, the problem might come in like this. Let's say that you want to select for three different traits at the same time to develop a superior variety. And generically, I'm just calling them A, B, and C. And let's say that for each individual trait in that population that you have one in 100 plants that have that trait. One in a hundred to have trait A, one in a hundred that has B and C. Okay, and I'm, I use the same number just to make it simple for the math there, essentially. Okay, let's say then that you want to identify plants that have all three of those traits in them. Now, to find one trait, it's not too difficult. You grow out a few hundred plants, and you can find one, two, or three plants that have trait A, B, or C. But how easy is it going to be to find plants that have all three of those traits in at the same time? Now, if they're on independent chromosomes, you know, then, the, then the, the probability of finding A, B, and C in the same plant is simply taking 0.01 times 0.01 times 0.01. That's one in a million. One in a million just to get those three traits. Again, to find a plant with one of those traits is fairly easy. To find all three could be very difficult. Now, I don't know what the math is. I haven't tried to get a hold of formula and plug it in to find out how many plants you would ha actually have to grow out to have like a 95% chance of making sure that you have at least one plant that has all three traits, but it's going to be more than a million. It's probably going to be like three or four million plants. Well, who can afford to grow out three or four million plants? If your valuation or cells in a petri dish, you could do it, but otherwise it's going to be really difficult because all of us breeders are limited on the resources that we have. We don't have that much money or people or time or land area, all of those things, to be able to grow out three or four million plants just in this one population to do our breeding in. And most of us are breeding from, from a number of populations. I mean, any one year I'm working on 35 to 45 plant populations for different things in alfalfa. So the problem here is that the frequency of the plants that you desire to select might be so low in the finite population size that you're working with. Okay, so I'm going to make a distinction between the theoretical infinite size population and the finite population size that in practice a plant breeder can work with because there are limited resources. In our finite population size of maybe just a few thousand plants that we're evaluating, we might not find any plants that have all three traits of A, B, and C in it. Okay, so what do we do with that? We go through population improvement. That's where we're really heading towards, population improvement. And the objective of population improvement can be expressed in two ways. One is, the first bullet there is to increase the chances of identifying superior plants in our plant population so that we can get the good recombination of genes and develop a superior variety from it. Okay? You want to have the plants there in the first place to be able to find them. And you do this to express it in a way that a quantitative geneticist might look at it by increasing the frequency of the favorable alleles or genes in a plant population, which means you'll increase the frequency of the favorable genotypes or the combinations of genes so that you can develop a better variety there. Any questions on this so far? Let's look at this visually then so you can get a concept of what we're trying to do with population improvement. Let's say that you start out 
with a population, I call it a base population, and this is just simply a frequency distribution um, for the trade or trades that you're interested in. And the better plants are over here to the right of the graph. So you have a normal bell-shaped curve, okay? This, again, it's just a cross-pollinated species, a lot of heterogeneity in the population, and you have a bell-shaped curve for frequency distribution. Well, let's say that the plants that we really want are way up here on this tail. In other words, they're really very, very rare. Again, so rare that with your finite population size, you might not even find any plants in there that have all the combinations of genes that you're really interested in. So what we might do is to go through population improvement, and in practice, what you're hoping to do is to move this population to improve it so that you move it to the right so the proportion of plants that have the favorable genotypes in them are much higher. Thus, with your finite population size, there's a much greater chance of finding, or you know, of even having, those combinations of genes in the, in the plant so that you can develop a better variety from it. So we're looking at it two different ways, visually and verbally, on the last slide there. Okay, now one point in terms of theoretical types of information here. Although I have these two graphs um, with the tails of them being in different places, one graph compared to the other, in theory, the tails ought to go out to the same um, amount there. Okay? Now, you know, one graph will be skewed one way and the other the other direction, of course, but in theory, there ought to be the same genotypes that are available in each one of those populations if they're large enough, okay? Talking about infinite size population. But with our finite size population, they might not be. But the theory that goes behind this that says that you ought to have the same genotypes at a different frequency, but the same genotypes possible in an infinite size population, you need to go back to the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium law. Have you all had that um, either in this class or previous classes? Can anybody, in your own words, explain what the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium law is? Do it kind of loudly, if you can. Anybody pull that out of your memory? Yes? Um, is it without, I think, the five factors that change the frequency of alleles in the population, the frequency of alleles in a population will remain Okay, exactly. So in essence, what, what it's saying is that if you consider just a single diploid locus in a plant population, and you were to take that population of plants, say you have 100 plants, and you were to cross-pollinate those at random, then the genotypic frequency, you know, like big A, big A, big A, little a, little a, little a, the frequency of those three genes will from that point on be the same generation after generation of random mating. You will have hit Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Okay, and what that frequency will be at Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium is this, um, P squared for big A, big A, where P is the frequency of the big A allele, Q is the frequency of the little a allele, so little a, little a is at Q squared, and then the heterozygotes at 2 times P times Q. That's theoretically what the frequencies of those three genotypes will be at Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. And again, you get there just by one generation of random mating, and it should stay there every generation of random mating after that, as long as there's no intentional or unintentional selection that goes on in a plant population, or mutations, or any of those. You said there were five factors, and I can't remember what all the five are. But as long as there's no selection, then it, it ought to be at Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Okay, so what that says is that when I go through population improvement, what I'm doing is trying to increase P and decrease Q, and as long as I haven't totally eliminated Q, as long as there's some of them, regardless of how rare it is, then I ought to have at least some of each one of these three genotypes at a different frequency, but they ought to be there. Now, Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium law works really great for one locus, but if you have multiple loci there, you know, then it takes longer to come to equilibrium. But still, it means you should have, in an infinite sized population, you should have the opportunity to see all the array of possible genotypes. But again, for our finite population size, they might not be there, okay? Especially if one or more alleles are really rare. Any questions on that? So just comparing the theoretical with the practical. Yes? Yep. 
Well, I'm just saying with Hardy Weinberg equilibrium, um, although you're changing the frequency of these genotypes with population improvement, in fact, that's what you're really trying to do is to change them. You, you want to increase Q, if, as long as big A, big A is your favorable genotype, you're trying to increase Q, or P rather, the frequency of the big A so that you increase the frequency of the big A, big A genotype. So you're, you're trying to do that with population improvement. Um, but what I'm saying, as long as you have some P and some Q, regardless of how much selection you do in a population, you still should have, in an infinite sized population, all of those genotypes present. Some of them are going to be really, really rare, but they should all be present. So I'm just giving you theoretical support for the fact that on those graphs I showed you previously, the tails ought to extend out with the same range, but the graphs will still be skewed in terms of the genotypic frequencies there. Any other questions? That, that was a good question to, to help clarify things. Okay, great. Um, but my point in this whole thing is that in spite of the theory behind Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, again, that talking about a finite population size, we don't have the, the resources, the time, labor, money, and so forth, to be able to grow out an infinite sized population to find the combination of favorable alleles and all the loci that need to come together to find the best combination of, of, uh, for a genotype to select for a variety. So, and again, this example is just even more realistic when we talk about more than one locus. You know, some traits are conditioned by multiple loci, and you might be selecting for more than one trait, like our example of A, B, and C up there. So again, it might be so rare in our finite population size to find the combination of genes we want that they're not even there. So we go through population improvement. Now, this is where we come to your M&M experiment. Um, I'm going to turn on the lights here for a moment. And um, at this point in time, I want to collect the data that you have so that we can make some observations on your population size of 10 that you took out of random, took at random out of that bucket. So the whole container of M&Ms is your population, OK? And what you've done is you've done, you've done an experiment, in a sense, where you've taken a random sample out of that population to represent that population with your experiment. But the question is, is your sample size of 10 sufficient enough to really represent that population? OK, so I'm going to put up here, um, let's see, we've got brown, blue, uh, yellow. What other colors do you have in there? Green? Orange? What else is there? Red, OK. Okay, what, what other colors? No blue. Oh, no blues? Okay. Do you have a blue one? Oh, first time anybody in this, in the, since I've been doing this experiment, anybody's picked out the blue one. I'll tell you more about that blue one a little bit later. Um, let's start up here in the front, though. And um, if you can call out to me how many you have, it would be easier for me if you did in the order of my colors. But if you don't, it'll just take me a minute to to recover, OK? But let's just, let's just go you know, one after another there and tell me how many you have of each one there. Three yellow. OK. Three orange. Four red. Red, red, red. OK, there we go. And all the rest of these are zeros. OK, good. Three brown. One yellow. Five orange. Whoops. Okay. Nick? Three brown, uh, no blue, one yellow, three green, two orange, and one red. I just got to thinking I better write smaller because there's so many of you. I'm, I'm going to run out of blackboard space. Okay. I got one brown. Okay. Two yellow. How many yellow? Two. Two? Four green, one orange, and two red. Okay, good. Yeah, you want to go next? Okay, good. Just a, a two brown? Zero. Oh, zero brown. Okay. 
Okay, good. Oh, you like those green ones. <laughs> okay. One brown, zero blue, two yellows, two greens, uh, and four orange, and one red. Oh, I'm sorry. Yep. How many red? Two. Two. Okay, good. Where are we at? I was wondering if you took any. How many green? Three. Three? Okay. Seven. Well, was that random? <laughs> okay. Okay, wonderful. Okay. Four brown, zero blue, one yellow, one green, two orange, two red. Two red? Okay. okay. Three yellow? Two yellow. Is that right? Oh yeah, okay, that's good. Uh, yep. One zero yeah, one zero one two three three. Do you take any Louise? No. Oh okay. Okay, so we've got a whole bunch of samples there of ten each. You took it out of the same population. I mean you can think of this like plants too if you wish. But um, what do you notice up there? How close was your sample one to another there? Was, were they fairly close? Or is there a lot of variability among your small samples there? Yeah, there's, there's a lot of variability in there. Um, so your sample size, would you conclude that that's sufficient enough to represent the population you took it from? No, it isn't. It's not sufficient enough. And you probably guessed that even beforehand, that 10 wouldn't be enough compared to the hundreds of M&Ms that are in there. By the way, you can feel free to eat them if you want. In fact, if you want to pass the container around and have more, uh, feel free to go ahead and do that as we go through the class period there. But, uh, but again, there's a lot of variability in there. You know, some, some are kind of, uh, have a fairly even distribution across. Um, others are really stacked up. I mean, this one in particular, seven orange, um, and only three green, look at that, there's a whole bunch of zeros in there. So with that finite population size, there's a bunch of genotypes that aren't even present, if you think of the colors as being like plant genotypes there. Um, one thing that I did, though, um, in the two packages of M&Ms that I put in that container, um, the other day at home I went through them all and I took out every blue one except for one. That was my rare genotype. And as I said before, in all other class periods that I've done this, or classes that have done this in past years, no one has gotten that blue one. So it kind of illustrated that even with a sample size of 10 times however many students were in a class, that, uh, that that blue one was so rare that even in that finite population size, bigger than your 10, but you know maybe as many as 100 or 200 in total, that no one had gotten a blue one even out of that either. Now, this year somebody did get it. Um, and I knew that some year that would happen. But again, the illustration is that with your finite population size, the genotypes that are present in the overall population, if it were infinite size, uh, wouldn't even be present possibly in your small population size. So that's the problem that we're grappling with with population improvement to try to help to increase the frequency of the favorable genes, thereby increasing the frequency of the favorable genotypes and the combinations of them so that you have a better chance of being able to have those in your finite population size you're working with and be able to develop an even better variety by doing that, okay? So that's what we're trying to do with population improvement. Anybody have any questions on this experiment and what we're trying to illustrate with it? Okay? So let's go on then and um, talk about how we do population improvement. 
So we talked about the objective of it, and is that, it, is that clear to everybody? Because don't, I'm not making the exam questions, but don't be surprised if there's not a question on the exam that asks you what's the objective of population improvement. So hopefully everybody's clear with that. Okay, so now what do we do to improve a population? Most of the time it takes recurrent selection. You might be able to do selection one time to improve it sufficiently enough, but most of the time it takes recurrent selection. And let me first of all define it, and what I've done is modified a little bit of a definition from back at the uh, midway through the last century by Hall, a, a corn breeder at the time, and uh, modified, tweaked it a little bit there to make it more common language there. But he calls recurrent selection, he says it's, it's meant to include reselection generation after generation. That's the recurrent part of it. You're doing it over and over again, generation after generation, to improve the population. Okay, so that's followed, or that's along with interbreeding. In other words, you're randomly cross-pollinating the plants that you select, and the selections are the plants you select. They're the superior plants to provide for genetic recombination. Okay, so let me read that again. Recurrent selection was meant to include reselection generation after generation with interbreeding of the selections to provide for genetic recombination. Now, what is that saying in common language? To look at the bird's eye view, it says that in one generation or cycle of selection, you're gonna evaluate a bunch of plants, you'll select the ones that appear to be superior, and then you'll randomly cross-pollinate those with each other to hopefully get better genetic recombinants the next generation and to produce the cycle one seed. And then you might take that cycle one seed and plant it out and go through the same process again so it becomes recurrent selection and do the selection and intermating all over again. And maybe three, a third cycle or a fourth or a fifth or even a sixth cycle of selection. Uh, some of you might be familiar with what they've done for, for decades with um, the corn population at the University of Illinois where they've been selecting for higher oil content in the seed and things like that. I don't know how many generations or cycles of selection they've gone through by now, but it's, uh, do you know, Luis? It's probably, how many? 50, okay. I mean, they've been going a long time with that thing, um, you know, generation after generation of selection. Now, you're not gonna do that in most breeding programs to develop a variety, but yes? Well, I have a question. If you're saving some of your base population, or it's not germplasm, how do you determine what are you saving with your base population? What do you mean you're saving it? Uh, so, Yep. The main thing is to make sure that you don't lose any genes out of the population. You don't want a, such a small population size that you're losing. I mean, it's one thing to not have the genotypes there, but you don't want to lose the, the genes or the alleles either. So you could have a small enough population size where you don't have all the alleles present either. And that's, that's, that's a bigger problem because you'll never get them back again. But if you're growing out a few thousand plants, you're not likely to lose some, any alleles unless they're so rare that you know, it's impractical to even find them, regardless of what your population size is. Um, but your objective is to take those rare alleles, make sure you've got them in your population that you're working with, and, and then go through population improvement so that you can then take those rare alleles and get them in combinations uh, with each other to give you good genotypes out of them. But you never want to, when you're sampling a population to do some breeding work with it, you never want to grow out all of the seed of that population, regardless of how little seed you have, because what if you grow it out and you have some kind of a disaster where the, um, something happens that kills all the plants, and that means you've lost your whole population. So you always want to keep a remnant of seed somewhere in storage in case you need a backup and go back to it in case some disaster happens that, that kills your experiment, essentially. Now, I don't know if that answered your question or not. That, it probably didn't. <laughs> I'm not sure exactly what you were asking, I guess. Uh, I'll ask you that Okay, yeah, if you want to catch me later afterwards or whatever. Okay, anybody else have questions on this, though? We'll get in more detail with it before too long, but I just wanted to give you the overall schematic involved in recurrent selection to approve a population. Okay? So the question that I want to address right now for a few moments is why is recurrent selection needed. Why do you need to go through generation after generation to improve a population enough so you can find the superior combinations of genotypes? 
And it's not always true that you need that, but most often you do. Well, the reason revolves around low heritability. Okay, now we talk in my course that I teach next semester on quantitative genetics, we spend about three weeks talking about heritability, why it's used, about seven different common methods that are used to compute heritability and so forth. And I know you've had some discussion about heritability in this class so that you understand basically what it is. But there's three reasons for low heritability that makes it so that we have to go through recurrent selection instead of just one cycle of selection to improve the population. One has to do with what we've talked about, with low frequency of favorable alleles. In other words, if we have a plant population represented by the circle with a whole bunch of genotypes, and I'm selecting for resistance to some disease, and um, disease is conditioned by just one diploid locus, but it's not a complete dominant situation, it's additive. So a small a, small a, the homozygote like this, there's a bunch of these in a the population, they're susceptible. So it's basically a susceptible population. And the heterozygote is moderately resistant, and a homozygote is what we really want to have, and that's completely resistant. But that allele, that big A allele, is so rare that you don't have that many moderately resistant plants, and in your finite population size, you don't have any resistant plants whatsoever. No big A, big A's. So I can't go into this population right now without improving it and be able to even find a resistant plant. So what I might do is grow out a few thousand plants and see if I can get a few of these plants that are at least moderately resistant. So I'll select maybe these heterozygotes. And then when I cross the heterozygotes together, whoops, obviously through Mendelian genetics, you see that you do get a different combination of genotypes. You get some resistant ones, some moderately resistant, and some susceptibles out of, those, out of the progenies of the plants that you've selected. So then the next generation, now you do have some resistant ones, and you can go in and select those out. So it took you two generations to accomplish what you want to do even there. Magnify that by the fact that with a lot of our economically important traits, they're conditioned by multiple loci. And again, you might be selecting for more than one trait at the same time, like A, B, and C that we started out with our discussion. So it might actually, you know, this just took one generation to, to go through population improvement and find the big A, big A. How many generations might it take to increase the frequency of the favorable alleles at multiple loci so that you get good combinations to give you superior genotypes out of that? You know, that might take you a few generations to get to that place, maybe three, four, five, or six, depending how many alleles are rare, how rare they are, and those sorts of things. Is everybody still with me there, or do I need to clarify anything for you? Okay, so low frequency of favorable alleles in the population that actually causes low heritability. And in my class, uh, one of the things that we do is to um, actually determine theoretically what additive genetic variance, uh, if you've seen the formula for heritability, you know that, that that's additive genetic variance over phenotypic variance. And um, so what we look at is what the additive genetic variance in a population would be theoretically at different frequencies of the favorable allele. And um, it's very interesting to see what the curve looks like and at what frequencies you get maximum additive genetic variance. When one of the alleles is, one of the two alleles in a diploid locus is rare, then your additive genetic variance is very small, and thus your heritability is very small. Any questions on that? Okay, an another reason for low heritability, this one is one that you probably expected. Large environmental influences on a trait. Let me change my trait a little bit. Let's say that I'm selecting plants for um, tall, for height. I want tall plants. So I'm, I've got plants growing out in the field, and I see some tall plants and some short ones and so forth. In fact, next period especially, I'm going to have you do a few stand-up exercises there. But let me have you stand up right now just to illustrate this point. Just stand right where you are. You don't even have to do anything. All you have to do is stand and look around if you wish. But let's say that you're, however many of you are, you're that number of plants in a plant population. And um, notice the variability in height that you all are, OK? There's a lot of variability there. Um, but let's say that I want to select the tallest plants. So 
I would select you, obviously. <laughs> and there are a few others of you that I would select, too, as being pretty tall. But the question is, um, you know, if there's a lot of environmental influences on the expression of that trait, how much confidence do I have that you're actually genetically superior in terms of height than some of the plants that are smaller? Um, you know, you might be growing in a microenvironment where there's better soil fertility. Maybe when, when the farm crew was fertilizing the field, uh, there was a rock there, and a, the, when the fertilizer gandy hit that rock, you know, the wheel went over the rock, a slug of fertilizer went down there. Or there's something about the soil that's better, better water holding capacity or whatever. So it could be that a shorter plant is genetically superior, but the taller plant is in a better microenvironment. So the shorter plant doesn't realize its potential for plant height. Um, so you know, that kind of thing can really mess us up. So I would end up selecting you, but maybe you're not genetically superior than a shorter plant is in that field. And thus, I haven't made the kind of progress from selection that I really want to because I haven't identified the, the superior genotypes. So large environmental influences, and when you think of it over multiple environments, you've got that genotype by environmental variability. Those two factors, G by E and environment, are the biggest problems that we have in plant breeding. And, um, you know, again, when I, when I teach my quantitative genetics course, we talk about those factors a lot and what you as a plant breeder can do to get around that um, in the best way so that you can identify the superior genotypes. Um, but again, large environmental influences um, cause low heritability, probably more than anything. Okay, you can go ahead and sit down. I'll just use you as a human experiment. I probably should have gotten permission from the, from the committee on campus to use humans as an experiment. Okay, and then there's one more factor there, and that's non-additive gene action. With non-additive gene action, that sometimes can cause us problems and sometimes can actually be beneficial. For instance, if you have a trait that's conditioned by complete dominance, and um, let me use the same population that I have as an illustration, but let's say that I do have some favorable homozy uh, homozygotes in there, big A, big A, and um, disease resistance now is conditioned by complete dominance so that the homozygous, um, the homozygote, the big A, big A, and the heterozygote gives us exactly the same phenotype of resistant plants. And if I'm just going into a plant population and I'm evaluating them, just depending on the phenotype, then I cannot distinguish between these heterozygotes and these homozygotes. So what I'd really like to select are the homozygotes, but I'm going to also be selecting heterozygotes because I can't tell the difference between them. So again, you can tell when you have some heterozygotes selected and you cross them, you're going to end up with some progenies that are going to be susceptible. Whereas if I could distinguish between the heterozygotes and the homozygotes and select on, only the homozygotes, then all the progenies are going to be resistant. Okay? So having complete dominance in some ways will help, as I'm going to illustrate pretty soon, but in, in this illustration it shows that sometimes it can hinder your ability to be able to really select the genotypes that you want in the plant population. By the way, what one or two things could you do to get around that and be able to distinguish between the homozygote and the heterozygote? One of them we'll actually talk about in another class period. How could you do that? How can you distinguish between those two genotypes? Yes? Say that again and maybe a little bit louder there if you could. Okay. I don't know if you're saying what I'm thinking of, but, but let me illustrate it like this. What you could do is you could take a susceptible, a heterozygous recessive, and use that as a tester. And this is going to be one of the breeding methods we'll talk about probably next week, actually. And so you can take each one of the plants in the plant population, and again, you don't know what the genotypes are yet, but you'll cross every one of them with a susceptible plant, which you would assume is going to be recessive, and evaluate the progenies. Okay, so all of these progenies are going to be resistant, right? These are going to give you a mixture 
but if you take the average performance of that population, it's, or, or of these progenies, this is going to be less resistant than that one, right, because you've got some susceptibles in there. And then, of course, this cross is, is going to be all susceptible. So by looking at the progenies of a test cross, then you can distinguish, at least in some cases, that theoretically that's what you're trying to do is distinguish um, what the parent plants, uh, what the value of them are in terms of resistance or whatever the trait is. Yes? Do you self-fit and look at the segregation or is that not? Pardon me? Do you self-fit and look at the segregation? If you self-fit, um, you could do that too. For pl plants that are easy to self, you could self that and they're going to breed true. They'll be all resistant. Um, this will segregate out and this will be all susceptible. So you could do that too. Yep. Yep, you could do that. What other method could you use? to distinguish them. Yes, Nick? Yeah, molecular markers. You could do that. That's not something I'm going to talk about, but molecular markers, you could do that as well to distinguish the genotypes there. Okay, so all three of these factors um, could be reasons, and any combination or all combinations of those could lower your heritability so that, again, um, you might not be able to accomplish what you want to with, what, with just one cycle or generation of selection to improve a population. So you might have to go through two, three, four, five, or even six times to improve that population sufficiently enough to have the genotypes that you want to have in your population to develop a superior variety. Okay, let me pause there and ask if there are any questions that you have. Everybody's pretty clear on it? Hey, let me give you an example then with the crop that I work with most, with alfalfa. Alfalfa out in the field has been growing a couple of years. Um, there's a plant right there that's big and green and healthy looking. And you can contrast that to the plant to the right that is stunted and chlorotic. And that one has a disease called bacterial wilt in it. Now with bacterial wilt, sometimes the plant is really bad off by the time it shows the top growth symptoms. So what we do, um, in breeding is to evaluate what's inside the taproot. So if you were to dig up that plant and slice through the taproot, you see this yellow-brown discoloration in it. And in fact, breeders and plant pathologists have come up with a visual scoring system from zero to five. Zero being a totally clean taproot with no discoloration, and five is at the other end of the spectrum where the taproot is just full of that discoloration and essentially the plant's dead. And then you have everything in between there. So given that, one of the things I did with my master's thesis research back more than three decades ago now is to determine the progress from selection, and this was recurrent selection in two plant populations, MSA and MSB. MS stands for mass selection, but we had the A and the B population. And remember with the scoring system that the lower the number, the higher the resistance level. So you can see that recurrent selection, first of all, did give us a more resistant plant population or two populations there. But it did take recurrent selection because notice with MSB, we started at a little bit over four. The fact that it wasn't a five means that there were some resistance genes there in the population, but they were very, very rare. And this is exactly what the breeders did before I came along with my master's research is that they had to select for plants that were maybe scores of threes because they couldn't find any zeros or ones. Maybe they found a few twos as well. And then after a couple of generations, they could select plants that, that looked more resistant, maybe zeros and ones, something like that. So you can see how it goes down. It didn't just jump from here to here in one cycle of selection. It went down like going down steps of a ladder. You know, went down with the increments there. Again, because of the heritability issue of not being able to have uh, the superior genotypes and identify them adequately in a plant population. So this is the first thing I want to illustrate is that it did take recurrent selection to give you a fairly resistant plant population. Second thing I want you to notice out of this though, as kind of a sidebar in a sense, notice that the response curves look different for the two plant populations. This one's more linear and this one's quadratic. Anybody know why that would be different like that? Nick? Different populations have like different alleles, so one can go become more resistant and one can't just because of yeah. the population. Yeah, that's exactly it. There are different genes or alleles for resistance in A versus B. And um, A might have some of the same genes as B. Essentially, B 
Um, I actually, this was part of my master's research, was to actually do both a qualitative and quantitative genetic analysis of these two plant populations because the breeders did suspect that they were, you know, they were of different origins and they suspected different genes for resistance. And what happened is that MSA or MSB had some loci. Now, keep in mind that alfalfa is an auto tetraploid, it's not just a diploid. So you've got four homologous chromosomes there that makes things even more complex. But there were at least two alleles with an additive genetic effects there. So every time you stack on another big A or another big B for the two alleles there, you get higher and higher resistance. But each allele has small effects. Adding on one allele is just a small effect to getting higher resistance. In contrast to that, with MSA, there may have been their same uh, loci there, but it also had a major dominant gene there. And if you just had one big A, for instance, th that one big dominant allele there, it boosted you from a five plant up to a two plant real quickly. So thus, you see this big jump from here to here just in one cycle of selection, because all it took was to get that big A allele there and, and identify those, and you made a big jump. But notice what happened is that eventually it leveled off like this, and it was impossible to get any higher. The same phenomenon we were talking about a while ago with this plant population where you have complete dominance. If it's, a, if it's a dominant allele and it has major effects, you can make progress in a hurry, but then it plateaus off. And if you want to get off that plateau, you have to do one of the two things that we talked about, either using a tester uh, or, or molecular markers to be able to uh, distinguish among the genotypes there. Okay, but again, the main thing I wanted to illustrate here is what recurrent selection does and the fact that you do need to have recurrent selection to improve a population enough to identify superior genotypes to develop a variety.